Breaking news this just in. Social media is filled with blowhards, experts, and know-it-alls that are there to lend you a helping hand to tell you why you're a terrible bow hunter. Hey everybody, I'm Dan Schmidt. Thank you for clicking. I know we tricked you there, but we're not going to trick you on this discussion. Welcome to the Deer Talk Now podcast. I'm your host today, Solo. We're talking about shot placement and, and broadheads because it's the season, right? Bow hunting season is underway just about everywhere. If you haven't started, you're probably starting as I'm talking, but I've already seen it. Um, we've been bow hunting for over a month now. We started September 1st out in Wyoming. And every year, okay, I've been doing this for almost 30 years, not on social media, obviously, but every year we see it. Here come the posts. Everybody's happy sharing their deer, sharing their excitement. First deer kills, posting them, all happy about it. And then guess what? Here come the comments and the negativity. Why is that? Why? I did not know out of the 3.6 million bow hunters in America that we have so many experts that are so easily going to rain on your parade. So today I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about broadheads and I'm going to talk about shot placement because to me those are the two most volatile topics among hunters, especially bow hunters, obviously. And th that's what I'm going to talk about today. So first of all, everybody has an opinion when it comes to broadheads. Everybody. Everybody's an expert. If you shoot mechanicals, um, fixed blades are no good. If you shoot fixed blades, mechanicals are no good. They're flappers, they're, they're junk, they're twizzlers, whatever you want to call them. Well, I am going to proclaim myself as the bow hunting pixie. No offense to anyone. And I'm going to tell you right now that it doesn't matter what you shoot for a broadhead. Okay, I did a quick scan of this. I'm going to give you a little background about myself. I'm not going to brag just because people see me and say, who's this guy here blowing smoke? Well, I'm nobody. If you don't, I'm nobody just like you, but I've got some experience. I've got over 35 years of bow hunting experience. I don't know how many deer I've killed with a bow. I believe it's well over 350 and I've shot them with everything. And back in the day, I was very, very skeptical about shooting um, mechanicals. In fact, if you want to call it an industry, I was probably the last guy in the hunting industry. I hate that term, but I have to use it because I've worked in the industry for 28 years that switched to mechanicals. And I did not switch to mechanicals until I found one that I thought was sharp enough. Back then, it was a Rage uh, Titanium, I believe, or the precursor to the Titanium was the first one that I found that was sharp enough. Um, today, I shoot Severs. I shoot them all, but with television show sever is our sponsor i shoot their their broadheads uh solely specifically no not all the time i shoot other broadheads i'm still testing them for the magazine but this is what i found 32 different i'll call major manufacturers of broadheads out there 15 i'm going to mention 15 real quick and i'm going to guess you're probably shooting one of them okay i broke them into three categories one category would be mechanicals. You probably shoot a Sever, a Rage, or an NAP, New Archery Products. You could shoot others. I'm going to get to some of these other ones. Uh, replaceable blade, you probably shoot a Muzzy, an NAP, a Slick Trick, possibly a Wasp. Uh, that's four. Uh, and in the fixed position blade, um, not replaceable blades, you'd have like a G5, a Magnus, a Sick, a Wenzel Woodsman, something like that. And then, of course, I have to mention other companies, Bloodsport, Gravedigger, Schwacker, Ramcat, Grim Reaper, Interlock. If I, if I hit one of yours there, you're going to say that's the best broadhead out there. And there's many others out there. Like I said, that's only 15 companies out of 32. But one thing that I've learned is a well-placed broadhead, a sharp well-placed broadhead is all you need. And you can get that with anything. Now, what happens is on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, you post a video, a photo, something of a kill, everybody's going to come on there and say, well, well, my dad shot this, or I shoot, I shot three deer with this one so far this year. Yeah, that's great. That, that works for you. But we don't know about all the other variables there. How far was the deer standing? How was it standing? Oh, he was broadside. Was he broadside? 
Or did, you know, did you bleat to stop when we did one of these things where he puts that leg down and he's actually kind of quartering to you? There are so many variables to that. And you cannot, unless you're in that, you cannot look at a picture on Facebook. I defy anybody. And I'm going to include all my bow hunting industry friends in this circle. I'm going to include Ted Nugent and, and Bob Robb. And Patrick Mytine and anybody else who is a very highly seasoned bow hunter, they can't tell where that broadhead hit. They can't tell what the deer was doing. You might see a hole and you say, oh, that's in front of the shoulder. Oh, that's high. You don't know. That deer's not alive standing there. So that's number one. Number two, you don't know what the circumstances were when that guy released that arrow. So I would say save your comments. Unless somebody's genuinely asking you for your opinion, I would say save your comments, congratulate them. Yeah, if you want to engage in some some good-hearted discussion, do that. But let's knock off all the, you know, I know better than you. I don't know better than anybody. I know what I think is good for me. And if somebody asks my opinion, I'll give it to them. But I'm not going to sit there and say that this is the way to go. That's what bothers me the most about this time of year is just all the, the rhetoric and the you know, oh, the, the you got to shoot heavy arrows. They got you know a, a big boy's arrow's got to be six hundred grains, or y- your FOC's got to be that. I know a handful of guys, and when I say a handful, two or three guys who have been bow hunting longer than I've been bow hunting, and I bought my first archery license in nineteen eighty six. I know two or three guys who are that geeky, who are measuring their arrows, weighing their arrows, calculating the FOC, blah, blah, blah. Sounds good. Makes you sound like an expert, especially in your own mind. But at the end of the day, that guy that's out there that's bow hunting three days a a year who can put that arrow into a two-inch circle at 20 yards 10 times out of 10, he's going to kill that deer just as fast and easily as you are if he's using a, you know, a Cabela's branded arrow with a a generic broadhead or like when I was first bow hunting my first kill was with a a full length eastern arrow because I didn't even know you're supposed to cut them off and in uh, a game getter broadhead that I bought at Fleet Farm that was already packaged that deer was do- dead in seconds so like I said let's lighten up on that and talk about uh, broadheads like I said no matter what you shoot it, it, the things that are going to matter are the flight characteristics the sharpness, the cutting diameter, and the cutting surface if you really want to get into it. The other thing that I see that people complain about a lot, well, I'd shoot rages or I'd shoot severs too or or muzzies or NAPs or whatever if I had that kind of money. A couple things, a couple things there. I, could talk, I know we want to keep this within 30 minutes. I could go off in an hour on that. Um, the point is moot. And you shouldn't even be engaging in the discussion if you're going to go after a bargain. Now, don't get me wrong. I was there for many years. I shot the cheapest arrows I could find. I I got the cheapest broadheads that I could find, and I used them. And, yes, I did kill deer with them. But when I really got serious about it, there's a couple things in hunting. Uh, I will put arrows, boots, optics, and broadheads that I won't skimp on. Because, and especially a broadhead... The same thing with ammo uh, if you're gun hunting. But with a broadhead, the best example I can give you there is this is no different than buying tires for your car or your truck. You get what you pay for. If you're going to try to buy the cheapest ones you can find, there's a reason why they're cheap. They're mass produced and they're probably dull. Um, and then they say, well, you know, those guys, they shouldn't have to charge me 40 or $50 for three broadheads. Well, let's look at that for a second. I, like I said, just look at this objectively. Okay, I went on just now before we started here. Uh, a pack of any one of those name brand broadheads is about, let's just say, forty-seven ninety-nine for three of them. Yes, some of those prices are up and down and all over the place. Approximately, that's what you're going to pay. But if you look at it, well, they, you know, they don't have. Well, okay, let's let's break this down. Forty-seven ninety-nine for three broadheads. The manufacturing on that alone is about 25 to 28 dollars approximately like i said you're going to find variances 
Um, the dealer is going to make about, well, this is between the dealer and the retailer. There's about a $15 margin in there. It's not that much. And you got to also consider that archery products fall under the Pittman Robertson excise tax. That's just like ammo. So those manufacturers have to build that into their price. So it's 11%. So you're talking about, I don't know, it's like four or five bucks in taxes that they have to pay before that broad, before they even get their dollars back from a sale. Pretty cheap when you, when, when you look at it these days, you know, um, number one. Number two, I could give you other examples. Uh, people say that about our magazine. Well, I can't afford it. It's $19 to have 10 issues for me to pay for ink, paper, printing, and content. Get that all together. You know, that's a losing. <laughs> Add that up. It's a li- in postage. We're losing money on that deal. We're making money off of advertising, not hand over fist. I won't be driving a 12-year-old pickup truck if we <laughs> if we were. But I'm just saying that it's the same thing with broadheads. It's the same thing with arrows. Anything else, everything costs money. One thing that I would um, I would highly recommend, and I'm going to uh, appeal to your patriotic tone here, um, bone, <laughs> is that you can go online and you can find knockoffs of all sorts of th- different things, including broadheads. I'm certainly not going to give my money to a Chinese company that's doing it, and that's what's happening, is these rogue um, manufacturers are going out there knocking off products that are being actually being made over there and selling them themselves at a very low pr- price. And people say, well, i got to save money. Well, you know what? I could say the same thing about, because the way I think about it was my dad was in construction. And so, well, I could get, you know, it's probably not the best example, but I could get so-and-so to do it for ch- cheaper or whatever. It's like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to buy local. I'm going to buy American if I can. Uh, you know, it, it, yeah, everything's made overseas, but I'm certainly not going to go out of my way to buy counterfeit products. Not going to do it. Man. All right, let's take a break to thank one of our sponsors. Today's episode of Deer Talk Now is brought to you by Walkers and the new FireMax Digital Shooting Muff. Featuring all new digital omnidirectional microphones, the FireMax features a slim, low-profile design with rubberized finish. A high-performance digital audio circuit delivers blazing fast reaction time, and the Muff's rechargeable USB is good for a charge of up to 150 hours of battery life. FireMax also has a full dynamic range HD speaker for clear and balanced sounds. I love these muffs because it's not just a muff that you wear when you're shooting. You can hear everything. It's got noise canceling, the highest technology in hearing protection. When it comes to your hearing, protect it or lose it with walkers. For more information, check them out at walkersgamier.com. So that that's just my rant on that. Forty seven bucks for three broadheads. You kill three deer with it. That's that's a pretty good price to pay, I would say. But again, um, uh, the quality is is all built into that price. You look at some of the sharpness on these broadheads. It's all built into that price. Um, if you can find a cheap one and it works for you, by all means, shoot it. You know, no one's saying you can't. Um, what works for you, I guess, is the telltale thing. And don't sit there and blow smoke at somebody and make them feel bad about, oh, you're shooting a flapper broadhead. You know, that's why you hit them in the shoulder and you couldn't find them. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Mechanical broadheads, let me back all the way up to the beginning. We started with cut-on contact broadheads, okay? So Ted Nugent, my buddy from Michigan and Texas, will tell you that he shot bodkin broadheads back in the 70s. He shot bear razor heads. Everybody did. They were the cut on contact, the original broadhead. But they, bo- those bow hunters found, those recurve guys and early uh, compound guys found, you could not get those things to group. So that what's what happened with the replaceable blade broadheads. Came about in about the 60s, early 70s. Basically, if you remember Schick razors or you use them, they had Schick razor blade injector blades that were made for broadheads. And you could actually put those in these early broadheads. And that's that was the first replaceable blade. When uh, companies like Wasp was one of the first ones, they were one of the first deer and deer hunting subscri- uh, advertisers back in the mid-70s when we first started. Um, Wasp came out with replaceable blade broadheads. 
smaller, sharp, much more accurate than the, the earlier versions, and especially the cut on contacts. So then you gave way to companies. Okay, you had Wasp, you had Satellite, you had the Berry Brothers from Minnesota with Rocky Martin Archery, the, you know, the, all those great broadheads. New Archery products, you know, they came out with the Thunderheads, and, and you had Muzzy. Okay, so Muzzy comes along, John Musaka Sr., comes along with just an absolutely ingenious design that, okay, so the knock on the first replaceable blade broadheads was they worked great if you hit where you're aiming, but sometimes those those blades would pop out. They just had little collars that kept this, some of them still do, that kept that blade in the ferrule, in the tip. So he came out with that design. If you haven't seen a muzzy, it's a basically a L-shaped blade, three of them, that slide together. You cannot, th- there's, they're in there. And that trocar tip, another, another, another great uh, innovation. So we went along. They were great broadheads. You know, uh, North American Archery Group at the time, they had, like I said, you had Satellite, you had Wasp, you had you know, Muzzy, you had NAP, you had all these great broadheads. Then comes along the expandables. So why the expandables? Because people, as these bows got faster and faster, people were still having problems with accuracy. Untuned bows, sure. And I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, you start shooting expandables, and they were shooting like field points, that accurate. The problem there then, always a solution and a problem. Solution, okay, pinpoint accuracy, pretty much. Problem, those first expandables, I swore them off. I didn't shoot them for, it was almost a decade. I, I, I shot 10 deer for the Equipment Guide article in 1997 with 10 different mechanicals, and I had some horrible results. Again, there was me. That was my rock farmer in me saying, oh, these things are no good or garbage. I'm not using them. Well, I had a little bit of uh, backing there because some of the designs were inferior, and the blades were not as sharp as advertised. That changed. Um, uh, Bruce Berry was actually the first one. He invented the sniper, which actually was the technology that was used with Rage. When Rage Incorporated, they actually bought that design. And then you had other companies coming along, and now you've got Sever. Um, so you have, you have the technology there. So what's the problem with mechanicals? I don't see a problem. What I see is, okay, so what's the advantage? The advantage is much bigger cutting diameter, much bigger entry and exit wounds. Is that a cure-all? No, it's not a cure-all. The cure-all is putting that broadhead where you need to put it, through the lungs, with a sharp broadhead, no matter how you do it. I said that from the very start. The problem is when you start encountering shoulders and you start encountering sideways shots into big rib bones and and stuff like that, and then people want to blame that technology. Don't blame the technology. Blame yourself. That's where the blame should always go. Does equipment fail? Sure, I'm sure it does. Um. Is that the reason why you didn't get the deer? I'm not going to, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say it was either a poor shot or just basically bad luck in what happened there. I'm not blaming the technology because that happens with, you're going to, there's going to be risk and reward, right? Um, You're going to have the same risk and reward or lack of reward with, traditional style broadheads because you're going to hit shoulders and shoulder bones are unforgiving. I I know some people are going to go, Oh no, I blow through shoulders all the time. Well, if you do that, I guess you're a better bow hunter than everybody I know, because I know a lot of guys with a lot of experience that have problems when they hit shoulder blades. Don't base judgments off of one decision for everybody else. You can blame it. You, you can put it on yourself. Like I said, what you drive as a car, what, you, what tires you put on your car, what kind of beer you drink, and what kind of broadhead you shoot is pretty much a personal uh, choice. If you're one of the people who genuinely want advice, genuinely ask for advice, and then just use that. Just like if you're buying a washing machine, you're going to take in all that information, and then you're going to try it yourself, and you're going to decide if you like that. A lot of times you will like it. A lot of times you're going to say, and that's that's how we acquire our taste for various products. We use it, 
it works for us. We have an awesome experience and you remember the experience. You don't remember the product so much. You remember the buck that you got and your dad was there to give you a hug or, you know, your buddy was there to help you blood trail it and drink a beer with you afterwards. Those are the things that you remember. I know I'm going off on a little bit of a tangent here, but I'm going to say don't blame the products. The products, they're going to stand the test of time whether they work or not. Okay, so that was my rant on broadheads. I'm going to bring it home right here by telling me, t by telling you that you are a terrible bow hunter because you don't know shop placement. Again, I'm being facetious. You're not a terrible bow hunter. That's what people are telling you, right? On social media, they're telling you post that photo, you post that video clip and they say, oh my gosh, you hit the liver. You, you only got one lung. You gut shot him. You hit him in the neck, blah, 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 blah. And you let this get in your head. A, l a lot of people do. You know, especially if you're a newer bow hunter, even if you've got a few deer under your belt, you're kind of still unsure about things and you let that bother you or you think about it too much. Let me, I'm going to be the first one to tell you here, the whitetail's anatomy is so complex that not even the most seasoned hunters truly, you know, comprehend it. They have a pretty good idea and there's some really good guys out there that really understand it, especially even watching video. So watching video, be very careful when making judgments about a shot because what you have to understand is when there's a hunter in a tree and he has a camera person with him, whether, whether you're in a tree or whether you're in a ground blind, I call it a parallax because you've got the hunter on one side, you got the video person here, and what that video catches is not true accuracy as far as how that arrow hits the deer that angle is different and it fools us i mean i've been uh, we've been doing our tv show for 18 years and it fools us all the time when we take that shot and in your mind you think you hit it here and then you look at the video and say well that's way off the the video can help but as far as shot placement goes actually how the organs are affected not always accurate so a couple of things I'm going to say is be very skeptical when anybody's giving you advice on, uh, when I say, you know, anybody, it'd be like somebody off the street who's being a blowhard on your Facebook post is um, a spine shot, a one lung shot, a liver shot, uh, gut shots, obviously, and even shoulder shots. Th the difference that you get here is that no two broadheads are going to act the same uh, as far as how that damage occurs. And you can't make blank, blanket statements like, well, I shot him in the shoulder with an expandable, therefore he lived. You don't need a lot of penetration uh, past that shoulder blade to kill a deer. If you, if you puncture that thoracic cavity and hit the lungs, you're going to kill that deer, chances are. Now, people say, oh, I've seen deer live it. Well, did you do neck necropathy on that deer? And did you actually see the the healed over lungs, I've never seen it. I'm sure it could possibly happen. I'm going to say it's extraordinarily rare. Um, the, the biggest thing is study the anatomy yourself so you can make better judgments on blood trailing. That's all this is about. Because what we know is if you don't breach both lungs, you're going to have a long trail ahead of you. It's The deer's going to be dead. I always say that the deer's dead. You just got to find them. Th that deer didn't, it wasn't wounded and ran off and survived. Some do. Most times they don't. It's, it's just a matter of finding them. So it's studying the anatomy, I guess, number one, to make the shot. Because those, those angles will fool you. When you have a, a severe quartering away shot, that arrow has to be much farther back. And it's actually coming through um, the stomach or the intestinal cavity before it gets to the, the boiler zone of the lungs and the liver and the heart. The other thing, um, and we have videos on our YouTube page that actually show this with real um, anatomically correct deer models in the fact that the liver, for example, sits off to one side of the, side of the chest cavity. So you can't just zip that arrow through them and say, oh, I hit him in the liver. Well, you might have. The blood trail on a seasoned hunter might say, well, this looks like liver blood. It's an opaque-ish maroon color. It's going to be one maybe telltale sign, not 100%. 
um, and the behavior of the deer, if it bedded down or whatnot, that's going to give you um, better ideas for blood trailing. But I always, I always suggest really studying it, number one, so you can make the shot, and number two, so you can blood trail the deer. And then, you know, keep your comments to yourself, and like I said before, unless somebody's truly asking you for your advice, and that's what you, and that's what you want. You, you want some advice. But there are, no, there are no blanket statements for any of this stuff. It, it's deer are really wired to survive, and they do some crazy stuff. Um, uh, look at Shane Simpson's videos. If you don't follow Shane Simpson, find him. He's got the Cali Chronicles. He's got that blood trailing dog. He has learned so much through those blood trailing efforts that it has really helped him understand. We've had him on the, the podcast, actually, and he's given us some great tips and insights there. But just on blood, uh, blood sign, deer behavior, when they circle back, when they bed down, when they don't bed down, um, various things that you find, um, it, you really learn a lot. And you can't just say, oh, well, there's bubbles in the blood, therefore I hit them in the lung. Maybe not. I've hit deer in the esophagus before. Nothing but an esophagus hit that I could have swore was a long shot, wasn't a long shot. And I'll tell you what, that was not an easy trail. Uh, several of them, actually. Not an easy trail to find those deer. So uh, I guess the, my long story, my long rant short there is use the information for your own good so you can better yourself, but don't be bullied into thinking that you're somehow an inferior hunter because this, that, or the other thing happened or this, that, or the other thing didn't happen. Because if you bow hunt long enough and you shoot enough deer, you're going to lose deer. And when I say lose them, you're just not going to find them. Um, you're going to have to do follow-up shots. And you're going to have a blood trail that completely puzzles you. But we have a lot of um, resources that are available to us now. We've got blood trailing dogs. We've got, actually, they've got arrow recovery systems. Uh, people have their own drones, actually, that actually helps to find deer. And you can also get buddies together and do a good old-fashioned grid search to, to look for your deer. But the biggest thing with shot placement, uh, studying those angles and knowing where exactly that broadhead's going to hit and using a scary sharp broadhead that is your choice, not someone else's. Hope this was at least a little bit helpful for you. Good luck bow hunting this year. And I would really recommend log on to the Deer and Deer Hunting Facebook page, share your photos. We're going to put them on all of our pages if you, if you want, and we're also going to share them in the magazine. And you can find out more about Deer and Deer Hunting and its rich history at DeerAndDeerHunting.com. For everybody here at the magazine and the TV show, thank you for joining us. I am Dan Schmidt. Join us again next week for another episode of the Deer Talk Now podcast. This episode is brought to you by Drop Tine Spirits and their premium 12-point bourbon whiskey. The story of Drop Tine's finest bourbon starts with being double barrel aged. What this means is they first aged the bourbon in new charred oak barrels in America's heartland, then send it to California to be finished in the salt air of the Pacific in the finest brandy barrels. Finishing their bourbon in brandy barrels was the choice of many trials to find flavors as unique as the Drop Tine deer. They wanted a bourbon that is not only warm to the palate, but it would sip smoothly and leave notes of fruit behind. They found the perfect brandy barrels in the Russian River Valley near Sonoma, California, and what they created is a bourbon whiskey that exhibits a sweet, floral, almost honey-like aroma balanced by caramel, toasted wood, brown sugar, and toffee. 12-point bourbon is only available online. To get a taste for yourself after the hunt, visit droptime.com. Deer Talk Now is also brought to you by HuntStand and the new HuntStand Pro app. Let me tell you, I've been using the HuntStand app for a couple seasons now, and I can honestly say it has changed the way I hunt. There's no more guessing on wind direction, property lines, and stand locations. The app takes my hunting to precise new levels that help me be more successful. The new HuntStand Pro app unlocks unlimited property data on a nationwide basis, including detailed property boundaries throughout the United States and most of Canada, including property owners' names in the United States with detailed ownership information. You can also access detailed public land maps and search for properties on a county, state, or province level. There are so many features that also help you dial in on the best spots based on weather conditions. For more information, visit the App Store or log on to HuntStand.com.
This podcast is brought to you by Cuddyback Cameras. I'm going to tell you guys, I've known Mark Cuddyback personally for over 20 years, and I've been using those cameras for over 18 years on Deer and Deer Hunting TV. The recent technology in the past few years has absolutely blown me away. And for those of you who don't have great cell coverage where you hunt, Cuddyback's ability to daisy chain from one camera to another camera with new Cuddylink technology is an absolute lifesaver. With the ability to connect 24 cameras, I place one home base camera at the edge of my property, swap that card out just once a month, and I get a look at all the activity on my entire property. My deer stay unpressured and the conditions are prime for opening day of bow season. For those of you who have the luxury of cell service, check out their new Cuddyback Tracks technology. This is game changing. For more information, go to cuddyback.com. Deer Talk is also brought to you by Traditions Firearms, a family owned business and inventor of the new Nitro Fire muzzle loader. When owner and president Tom Hall and his daughter Allison first showed me the Nitro Fire system, I was immediately impressed that it is not only more convenient than conventional muzzle loaders, but it is safer. The ability to quickly remove the powder charge is a big deal, such as when crossing a fence, climbing into or out of a tree stand, transporting your rifle in a truck or an ATV, or when hiking rough hills, wading creeks, or plunging through swamps. I've used the Nitro Fire on numerous deer and deer hunting TV hunts over the past two years, and I find it safe, accurate, and very dependable. The gun is available in numerous configurations. To learn more, visit traditionsfirearms.com. The Deer Talk Now podcast is also brought to you by Apex Outdoor Rewards. Hit record and win rewards. Enter the Apex Whitetail Challenge in your state for your opportunity to win big cash. Enter today and get a 4K camera absolutely free. That's a $300 value absolutely free. There are some serious rewards here, guys, so be sure to enter in your state. Who would have thought your next buck could be putting money in your pocket? Reserve your spot today at apexoutdoorrewards.com. The Deer Talk Now podcast is also brought to you by Full Range Mounting Systems. These mounting systems are a great way to manage all of your mounts in a stylish and organized manner. We are using their pedestal mount here on the podcast set for two shoulder mounts and it looks just awesome. Be sure to check out all their mounting solutions at fullrangesystems.com. And finally, Deer Talk Now is brought to you by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. Hey, if you've watched me on Deer and Deer Hunting TV, you know that I'm an equal opportunity bow hunter, and for most of the past decade, that has also included crossbows. In fact, I shot my first crossbow deer with a 10 point over 12 years ago, and to say that I've been impressed with their technology is an understatement. This year, I'm shooting the new Nitro 505, the fastest crossbow in the world. It is light, compact, and includes the revolutionary AccuSlide cocking and decocking technology. Whether I'm in a tree stand, ground blind, or spot and stalk hunting, I know the Nitro 505 is up to any challenge. Check one out at a dealer near you or log on to 10pointcrossbows.com for more information.